and we'll make goodie bags for y'all. Please don't be offended. If you don't want the goodie bag, just don't take it. But I can't keep all that stuff. I do need to give it out somehow. And so instead of the usual chocolate at the end of the semester, y'all getting contraception. All right. You don't have to use it. I'm in no way encouraging you to uh, do anything that you don't normally do. But find a good home for it if you're not using it. That's all I'm saying. Okay, well, let's talk about the endocrine system. Um, I wasn't thinking about that. Well, it's funny because she brought it, and I was like, oh, that, that's really cool because we can, I always talk about birth control when I do the female reproductive system in lab, but she brought so much. I thought she was just bringing exam, like samples in or something, but no, she brought like everything, and so now I have to find homes for all of this stuff. So anytime anybody needs anything, that's when you can come to my office and just grab it. Don't talk to me. Just come take what you need and leave. <laughs> All right, so let's get in. Oh, God, no. I do not want to know anything personal. And no questions asked. Just come in, grab what you need, and go, and don't talk to me. Let's talk about the endocrine system. And I want to talk about it first by um, including the nervous system with it, because in reality, it's these two, nervous and endocrine together, that control basically all of our bodily functions. The nervous system does it with uh, neurotransmitters, right? And the endocrine system does it with hormones. So they basically do the same thing. Um, they're both secreting something or releasing a substance. Um, either it's a neurotransmitter or a hormone if it's the endocrine system. And they both have uh, receptors that bind to those substances, okay, whether it's a neurotransmitter or a hormone from the endocrine system. And that is basically how these two guys do the same thing, but a little bit differently, and are able to control the entire body, all of our functions. So let's talk about those endocrine glands that are producing hormones. But before we do that, I want to uh, show you the difference between an exo, exocrine gland and an endocrine gland, OK? And really, it's very simple. The exocrine glands, exo means outside. These are glands that produce something um, that is not a hormone, first of all. And second of all, it has a duct to travel through. It has to leave the gland through a duct. The um, endocrine glands are secreting hormones, and those hormones leave that gland without a duct, okay? There's no um, tube or anything that takes it to somewhere else. When an endocrine gland produces hormones, those hormones will then diffuse into the interstitial tissue and then diffuse into blood vessels and then they'll be circulating through our bloodstream. And they will remain circulating into the bloodstream until they get to where the target cell is. And how does it know it's a target cell? It knows because that target cell will have a very specific receptor for that hormone, okay? And that is the main difference between exocrine and endocrine. So when we're talking about the endocrine system, we are only talking about endocrine glands. Examples of the other guys, the exocrine ones, are things like your sebaceous glands secreting oil, uh, your salivary glands secreting saliva. These are all things that produce something but also have a duct in order to transport it to where they need it to go. Um, and then examples of our endocrine glands are pituitary gland. Remember where that is? Here. Thyroid in the neck. Parathyroid on the back of the thyroid adrenal on top of the kidneys, and then the pineal glands in the skull or brain. Cool. I don't know if that camera's set right or not. I didn't even do a sound check. I'm just so off of it today. I walked out of my house wearing sandals, and it was freezing. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so on this picture over here are endocrine glands. Let's just point them out. Excuse me. Let's point them out. You have the pineal gland in the um, cerebrum, the pituitary gland hanging down from the hypothalamus, the thyroid gland in the neck, the parathyroid behind that, and then the adrenal glands. Those are your endocrine glands. But there are other organs 
or tissues all around the body that also produce hormones and participate in the system, even though they're not true endocrine glands, okay? Um, you have things like the, um, well, the hypothalamus is number one. We're gonna talk a lot about the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus actually produces hormones and then it sends it over to the pituitary to be secreted there. Um, the thymus produces hormones. The pancreas producing insulin, that's a hormone. Um, the ovaries producing estrogen, that's a hormone. The testes, the kidneys, what do the kidneys produce? Renin, that's a hormone. You get what I'm saying? Okay, so there are other parts um, of our body, other tissues, other organs that also take part in the endocrine system even though they're not true endocrine glands. But the only true endocrine glands are your pineal, pituitary, parathyroid, thyroid, and adrenal. Okay, so these hormones are being produced. They are diffusing into the interstitial tissues. They'll pass from there into the bloodstream. They are going to uh, find their target cells and bind with the receptors of their target cells. Most of the time, these receptors are proteins and they are specific for the hormone. Now, those proteins that make up those receptors continuously undergo renewal. They're constantly being broken down and rebuilt again. Um, and because of that, we have the ability to regulate them either by increasing them in number or decreasing them in number. Just like your bones, if you're constantly demineralizing and remineralizing, it's always changing. So if I have a certain number of receptors in an area and the hormone for those receptors is excessive, I've got way too much of this hormone, I can lessen that effect by down-regulating the receptors, meaning I can break down some of those receptors and then not replace them. So if you have less receptors, the effect of the hormone is lessened. You're sort of ignoring the hormone that's circulating. Does that make sense? Okay, at the same time, if I have too little of a hormone, so the effect is not being felt enough, I can increase the number of receptors by up, up regulating them, and that will help to increase the effect of that hormone, okay? So if you think of it as this hormone, hormones are circulating anyways, right? They just kind of come out like clockwork. They come out in little bursts regularly. So if the hormone is there anyways, I can control the effect of it by controlling the receptor for it, okay? If you don't have the receptor there to bind with it, it can't be activated, it can't do anything. Make sense? So hormones, um, sorry, hormone receptors are constantly undergoing regulation by either being down-regulated, and you down-regulate to decrease the number of receptors if you have too much of this hormone circulating. You don't need that much. Or it can be up-regulated if you don't have enough of the hormone, but you need more of an effect. So increase the receptors that can bind to it, then the effect will be increased. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. So receptors are undergoing down-regulation or up-regulation. Up here, up top, this entire picture right here, that is the mode of action of um, hormones, most of the hormones, and we call them circulating hormones. These are circu circulating hormones. So what are circulating hormones? It means you have a endocrine cell producing a hormone, there's little gray dots right there. It diffuses into the interstitial tissue, diffuses into the bloodstream, circulates into the bloodstream or in the bloodstream until it reaches the target cell. And the target cell has a receptor for that hormone. Makes sense, that's where it leaves, diffuses into interstitial tissue, binds with that receptor. So that is the usual mode of um, action or path that our circulating hormones take. 
Um, there's a few areas where you may see something a little bit different, where the hormone doesn't have to go too far. It doesn't have to go to the bloodstream. It can be a local hormone where the cell produces the hormone and then it just goes next door to the next cell and works on that cell, right? So we call those local hormones or paracrines. So that's the example you're looking at here. You have a cell producing a hormone or a paracrine and it binds to the cell next door. Didn't have to go into the bloodstream, didn't have to circulate. Um, and then you also have an option that a cell can produce a hormone for itself. And that is what we call autocrines, auto meaning cell. So this is where a cell is producing a hormone and that same cell has the receptor for the hormone, right? So it's like, you just take it from downstairs, go give it to upstairs. You're actually self-sufficient, making your own hormone for yourself. These are just examples of hormone activity. Um, hormones themselves are classified chemically into either Sorry, I'm having a hot flash. Oh my mic. I was so cold, now I'm so hot. And we're doing hormones, how perfect. Okay. It's funny, I just happened to have this jacket in the car because, um, was it this past weekend that I was playing a tournament? Yeah, I was playing that tournament in Destin and it was like freezing all of a sudden. It rained and then it just got really, really cold. Okay. So chemically, hormones are classified either as water-soluble or lipid-soluble, okay? Just from the name alone, do you see a difference here? Do you remember anything about lipids crossing over a cell membrane or water crossing over cell membranes? No, probably not, that's fine. Okay, so water, what does water do? Water crosses easily, right? So water-soluble hormones have no problem they can diffuse in an interstitial fluid. They can diffuse into the bloodstream. They're just going about wherever they need to go because they're water soluble. Water is the easiest thing to move across any membrane. So they're going to circulate freely. They're going to bind to receptors that are on the surface of their cell. Coincidentally, just because this picture is here does not mean you need to memorize all these steps. I just wanted to show you where the receptor is. So they have receptors on the outside of these cells. And examples of those would be things like amine hormones, peptide hormones, protein hormones, lipid soluble hormones, okay? These are your fat hormones. These are the ones that need a little bit of help. We can't just have lipids traveling around on their own, right? They have to be disguised. Because remember, we couldn't even absorb them through um, the small intestine without coating them in something. They have to be disguised. Nobody likes fat. So lipid-soluble hormones will actually have to use a protein to be transported through our bloodstream, right? So they have transport proteins that will kind of cover them up and not let anybody know that this is a lipid on the inside. And then um, their receptors will actually be inside, inside of the target cell. So they're going to have to cross through that plasma membrane, go inside to find the receptor. Examples of... Um, Lipid soluble hormones are things like our steroids, uh, thyroid hormones, nitric oxide. Is that a cough? Just walk by. Why am I so easily distracted? Okay. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so, were you, oh, you were in lab. Okay. Main thing to remember, water soluble circulate freely, receptors on the surface of the cell, fat soluble circulate with transport proteins and have receptors inside. No comment. Uh huh. Yeah. I know where that is, yeah. <gasps> I'm like, you know, the man you need to get back inside immediately. Oh my god. What's up? I was on the stage with a guy and I'm like, oh my god. Are you serious? What was going on? I went to the bathroom We gotta stay here. Well, the date's yeah. prolonged. Well, long story short, I came out and a employee was holding a manager hostage, but at a different location. 
Exciting. Yeah, it's I was okay. like, okay, there's one guy was like, I don't come here just to eat. He said, I come here for the entertainment. <laughs> no, you go to Waffle House for the entertainment. Waffle House. Walmart's just straight up scary. Waffle House is entertaining. Waffle House is entertaining. Wow. Is he going to get a second date or no? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. I don't know. Sometimes we associate negative feelings with people that are with us. That's awesome. That is exciting, actually. That's kind of exciting. Yeah. So, and isn't it funny how we're all, like, conditioned to be just a little scared when you see a cop, right? Even if you do nothing wrong, you see a cop, you're like, oh, shit. You know, like, what did I do? What am I doing? What am I doing? Making sure you're not doing anything wrong. It's just instinct. We can't help it. Do what? <laughs> I do it all the time. It's like I assume every cop I pass by is going to pull me over for something. You know, they're just looking for something to do. I'm always, I speed, I think I speed a lot too, unfortunately. Do not speed, y'all, it's not worth it. But I can't help it, and it happens. But I do a lot of driving, so I do end up speeding a lot. And then it seems like every time I get pulled over, it's not enough. I have to, like, have a conversation and dispute it. Anyway, just because. Yeah. yeah. Just because. <laughs> I'd be like, if I knew how fast I was going, I probably wouldn't have been speeding. Huh? <laughs> there was one cop one time I looked at him, I was like, dude, I'm tired. It's either I'm going to look at the road or look at the speedometer. Which one would you prefer? And he looked at me. He didn't give me a ticket either. He was like, ma'am, just please stay awake till you get home. Safe ride home. I know I was like so tired that day. I was like, dude, look, I just got off of work. I'm exhausted. I've been driving for an hour. I just want to go home, you know? And I was like, yeah, I can't focus on two things at one time. It's either I'm looking there or I'm looking there. What do you think? Yeah, yeah like, which one would you prefer that I do? And then he just laughed. He was like, okay, here. What's it called? Hunt's? Hunt the Oyster Bar? Yeah. Oh. Oh, no, it's not the restaurant's fault. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> That's so sad. Yeah, right. You see a lot of that in the ER. Oh, yeah, if y'all start working in hospitals, you're going to see a bunch of stuff. <laughs> That's a fortune right there. That's his livelihood. That you Did you pick it up for him and let him have it back or no? Don't do that. I mean, either you take it home and sell it or you give it back to him. But don't give it to the nurse. She's just going to throw it out. What's wrong with you? There's like 10 bucks a pill right there. <laughs> I would have sold it. Here's a summary of lipid soluble hormones. <laughs> Look at that. Aldosterone, cortisone, androgens, testosterone, estrogen. Those are your lipid solubles. Remember, they have to go inside to find the receptor. Thyroid hormones are part of that. Your water soluble, these go freely and easily. Things like epinephrine, norepinephrine, melatonin, histamine. There's one time I got pulled over on the bridge and I got out. <laughs> I got out and I told the cop, um, I didn't have anything with me. I didn't have a license. I didn't have proof of insurance. I didn't have car registration. I couldn't find anything that day. And so I was like, dude, just arrest me. I'm done. Because he had pulled me over and I couldn't find it. And then I was like, I'm going to have to get out of the car to look in the trunk. And so I got out of the car to go through all my bags and stuff. And then I'm like, dude, just, just arrest me. I'm done. 
I'm tired. I'm, I'm sick of life. Just arrest me. And he just laughed. And he was like, you remind me of my girlfriend. She never knows where anything is. And I was like, yeah, I'm just, I, it can't get worse, right? Just arrest me. I'll be happy in jail. I won't have to work or pay taxes. And he was like, no, ma'am, you do not want to go to jail. No, ma'am, it's not better. And I was like, yeah, I'm pretty sure it would be. <laughs> he refused to arrest me. Whew. Okay, so... <laughs> Okay, so these hormones, once they reach their target cell, um, how do they do what they're supposed to do? And that really depends on what the hormone is, what the target cell is, and what it was meant to do. But it may do things like cause that cell to synthesize new molecules. It may change the permeability of the cell's membrane. It may stimulate moving of substances inside of the cell or taking things out of the cell. It's going to alter the, may alter the metabolic actions of the cell. Or it may cause contraction if it's like in a smooth muscle or in a cardiac muscle cell. Okay, so it really just depends on what cell it's going to, on what it's going to cause. Yes, ma'am. Okay. That is actually a good question, and we're going to readdress it when we do the reproductive, but here's what I want you to look at. Fat cells hold estrogen, right? Fat estrogen is one of your fat soluble. There it is. Estrogen is one of your lipid soluble hormones. Okay. Um, in reality, and we'll look at this process when we go further into the uh, reproductive hormones. In reality, it's not that fat cells hold estrogen but that in order to make estrogen, you do take parts of fat. Like there are fatty acids and things that are used because it's made, it's really derived from cholesterol. Yeah, so they kind of like, they, somebody found out that cholesterol eventually is gonna be used to make testosterone or estrogen or progesterone, all of our steroids really. Um, and then said, oh, so that's where, that's where those are? No, that's not where they are does not hold estrogen, no, but we, it is a form of um, a fat that is transformed into, does that make sense? Yeah. Um, but that's where they get that from. Okay. Which is why also, if you've ever seen like someone who's super anorexic, doesn't have a lot of body fat, they may not have enough estrogen, they won't have enough sex hormones because it, you need that fat to, to produce it. Yeah, well, if you don't have your, your hormones, then you're not going to be ovulating. There's not going to be a menstrual cycle. But again, that has to do with using of that, um, that fat is used to produce these hormones. So it's not that it's stored in there, but it's used to produce it. Yeah. Harley, I'm more feminine now. <laughs> Uh-uh. Don't work that way. No, no, no. Oh. Oh, yes. Yes. Testosterone levels. They do. Yeah. They do. Okay. She's talking about obesity. Yeah, but, okay, so I, let's save this, save this for when we do the reproductive hormones because you'll be surprised at the pathway that it takes and it'll make a lot more sense then. Okay, so um, did we do this one already? Okay, so the response of that target cell to that hormone is also dependent on several factors. Things like the concentration of the hormone in your blood. Do we have a lot of it or not enough of it? The number of receptors. Remember, this is one of the ways we can regulate by upregulating or downregulating. If we don't, you weren't here, you were in the bathroom. If we don't have enough, if concentrations are low of this hormone in blood, we can upregulate receptors, increase receptors, 
so that the effect is increased. Or if we have too much of a hormone circulating through blood, we can downregulate the receptors, decrease the number of receptors so that um, the uh, effect is lessened. So that's one of the ways. So either we change the concentration in blood. If we can't do that, we can also change the number of receptors by up or down regulating. Um, and then there are other hormones that are going to influence these hormones. We do have hormones that are secreted in order to cause another hormone to be secreted. So we have regulating hormones that come out. Um, and then we have hormones that can be two hormones that help each other out. So if one of them is alone, but the other one, you know, alone it's doing an effect, if the other one joins it, the effect is heightened. So whenever two hormones can work alone for the better, we call that a synergistic effect. And you guys already know what synergism is, I hope. And the opposite of that, if two hormones oppose each other, Whereas one raises the level of blood glucose, the other one decreases the level of blood glucose. We call those an antagonistic effect when you have two things that are opposing each other. Okay. Um, and then we have um, negative feedback system that regulates most of our hormones. Remember, they are secreted in short bursts when needed. We do get the instructions from the nervous system, mainly the hypothalamus. Um, and then we have things in our um, bloodstream that can detect changes, right? Things like glucose is dropping or whatever, and then react to that. So we've got chemical changes in the blood that will alter the amount of hormones we have. And then you have the other hormones that control those hormones. This is just a general idea of what's going on. I'm gonna remind you again, it's all about the individual hormones when it comes to the endocrine system. So we call that regulation a negative feedback. Um, negative feedback is where you know um, you have a condition that's altered, like say uh, low here. It's doing um, you have a low glucocorticoid level in blood. Then you've got your receptors that pick up on that. You have your um, hypothalamus tells your pituitary we need more glucocorticoids. It goes to the medulla and the adrenal cortex produces more glucocorticoids. That production of glucocorticoids or that increase has a negative effect on the production. That's what we call a negative feedback. Um, and that's really how most of our hormones are controlled, right? If you're um, deficient in something, you ask for it to come, you get enough of it, you stop asking for it. Sort of like if you're sitting at a restaurant and, um, you know, I'm let's say I'm, we're sitting at Euro Cafe and I have a plate full of curly fries because I absolutely love their fries. Um, <laughs> they're amazing, right? But I like them with ketchup. So I decide to order, or I ask the server for ketchup. And then um, before you know it, I have a server come by and throw some ketchup on the table. Thank you. But then another server comes by and throws some ketchup on the table. Okay, thanks. By the time the third one comes by and throws ketchup, I'm like, okay, stop. I got enough ketchup, right? And that's what negative feedback is. It's just telling something to stop because you have enough. Um, 